everybody. I got a fun project today, something a little bit different. We're going to start out with an aspen bowl that I rough turned and then put in the kiln. So this has been out of the kiln for probably a month, just sitting on the table waiting for me to get around to it. This bowl was roughed out with a batch of a whole bunch of them, and a lot of them I cored. So I used my 100 millimeter jaws on the chuck when I did all of the roughing. I took this tenon down to a size that will fit in my 50 millimeter jaws. It might be a little bit small for this size bowl, but because it's already rough turned and I'm going to have the tailstock up throughout the vast majority of the rest of the process, I don't think that it's going to be a problem. I'm trying to get the bowl into round on the outside now. The plan is going to be that I'm going to have a flat rim that's maybe an inch wide at the top, and I want it to be parallel to the bedways on the inside and the outside. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just try to get the outside to where it's true and then start working on the little part of the rim. I need to get the top edge of the rim trued up and then I need to see how much I have to work with coming from the inside, which is actually pretty good. This bowl did not move a whole lot. I've got a really good amount of thickness here. So I'm going to start trying to go down a little ways parallel to the bed and see how much thickness I'm going to be able to end up with. This is my diamond carbide tool and it was just convenient for trying to go in sort of straight. I'm using my square negative rake scraper to try and flatten this edge out. It's not crucial, but I really want to try to get the outside of this rim as parallel to the bedways as I can. And you'll see why a little bit later. I'm going to use a whole bunch of different tools here. I've got two different sizes of my bowl gouges, and then I'm going to be using a couple of different negative rake scrapers. And I'm trying to just smooth it out and refine the shape.
I actually really like working with aspen, which is a good thing because there's a ton of it around where I am and it's basically considered junk wood. My only real complaint about it is that it's really soft and it bruises easily. But if I didn't push so hard on the bevel, I probably wouldn't have so much trouble with that. So I can't really blame that on the wood, I suppose. I know, I know, I took all that time to make that rim nice and smooth, kind of forgetting that I need to cut a little bit of a channel down in there. So now we're going to do that, and then I will set about making that nice and smooth. The first order of business on the inside is going to be to try and match the profile of the rim on the outside. It comes in about an inch and I want it to be the same on the inside and the outside. That's pretty good on the rim, and now I need to finish getting the inside trued up because it's still quite out of round. I left a really small lip there at the bottom of the rim, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, and that will make more sense in a little bit. I cut out all of the sanding because the rest of the video is going to be on the embellishments that I did for this bowl. So I'm going to go ahead and do the Axe abrasive sanding paste on the inside and the out, but not on the inside of the rim. Before I put the abrasive paste on, I started with denatured alcohol on the surface and then a one pound cut of shellac as a little bit of a sealer. I'm following up the Axe abrasive paste with Brad's abrasive paste, and then for the top coat on this, I'm going to use the Axe polish paste. The inside of the rim is left completely raw. I didn't even put shellac on that. And now for something completely different, and the fun part. So what we have here is a DIY precision drilling jig. Um, I know that Robert Sorby makes one that goes into a tool rest that has, I think, different size drill guides. But those are all for kind of large drill bits. So I needed something that I could use really small drill bits with. So I have engineered up 
this contraption using a bunch of stuff I had in the shop. My dad gave me this Craftsman milling jig. It goes on a drill press, and it has two axes that move back and forth with hand wheels. I rigged up a holder cradle thing for my Dremel, and then I have a little drill chuck in the Dremel so I can use a variety of different sized drill bits. The milling jig is just screwed down onto a 2x10, and the 2x10 is mounted to the lathe with a piece of hardwood that slides between the bedways and then twists and gets tightened with that bolt that's on the top. I cut all the sound out of this part of the video because the scream of the Dremel is just awful. The Laguna lathe has an indexing system, and it has three different rings. There's one that has 48 stops, one that has 36 stops, and then another one that has, I don't remember if it's 12 or 14 now, but in any case, so you can do a variety of different stops using the indexing system. So between that and the fact that I can make this drill bit go perfectly perpendicular and even with a spindle, I can drill very precise holes, which I'm going to need for what I'm doing next with this project. So I designed a pattern and it basically has three rows of holes. The inside and the outside rows are both going to have 48 holes and the inside is going to have 24 holes. So I've got the first row done, and now what I'm going to do is find the place on the bowl where I made the marks, and then line the drill bit up precisely with that side to side. And then I can go about drilling the second row of holes, which is going to be every other stop. I'm using the same indexing ring with the 48 stops. I'm just going every other one for this middle row. Now I'm going to line up the position for the last row of holes, and this is going to be 48 holes. The indexing system has a pin that slides into whichever hole you're going through on the disc and then there's a little threaded lock. The first row, I did half of them using the threaded lock, and then that got to take too long. So then I just kept the pin pushed in with my finger while I did the drilling part of it, and that also took too long. And I decided finally that since I wasn't really moving it very much, I just moved it, and then I didn't hold it. It stayed where it was fine while I drilled the hole, which is good because my hand got really tired. I think it took me maybe a little over an hour to drill all of the holes. And now for the fiddly part. This took me a lot longer than it should have because I kept screwing the pattern up, but once I got going, it wasn't too bad. You'll see I have my little helper, Bailey, here. He's got his chicken. He's going to have a little cameo since he decided he needed to sit by me while I was doing this work.
Trapped. Silly boy. In the den, he has this big stuffed chicken, and in the house, he has some sort of other stuffed animal. Right now, it happens to be a pig. I'm not sure if he was weaned a little bit too early. We got him at four and a half months, but he does this funny thing where he gets his stuffed animals and he holds it in his mouth, and he makes bread with his feet, so it's a little bit like a cat. It's very sweet, and he puts himself into a little bit of a trance, but that's a welcome change sometimes. He's still a little bit active, even though he's four and a half years old now. Anyway, I have a big toolbox that I have all of the yarn and the sewing bits in, and it was blocking his exit from the couch, which is was his little conundrum there. Now that we are free of beagle distractions, we can carry on with the sewing bit. This is a flat ribbon kind of a yarn, and it's dyed with like a gradient blue. So it's all the same roll of yarn. It just is going to have a different shade, which is really pretty cool. It is very fiddly, though, partially because I don't know what I'm doing. This is the first time I've ever done this. I'm sure there are way more efficient ways to do the sewing as far as the pattern goes, but I just did what I needed to do to make it work right which on several occasions was to go back and have to do a couple of stitches over because I'd done them in the wrong place. Two steps forward, one step back kind of a thing. Because this yarn is flat, I did have to make sure that when I pulled it tight that it was laying flat against the wood. I didn't want to have any twists in it. It looked funny. So that was a little bit fiddly too. I did end up going back and enlarging the holes. I couldn't use the jig because I'd already taken the tenon off, but the holes that were there made for lovely pilot holes, and I didn't have any issue just enlarging them with a slightly bigger drill bit. I had to go in and out of most of them at least twice, and there just wasn't enough space for this relatively thick yarn and the needle to go in and out without making the holes bigger. So all in all, it came out really nicely. I didn't tie any knots on the inside. I just took it back to the shop when I was finished, cut the strands off, and I used CA glue to kind of set everything. And then I cut some leather and glued that over the inside yarn. And that's why I wanted that lip in the bottom. So that's relatively flush now. I'm really happy with the way that this came out. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Hit that thumbs up button if you like this video. Consider subscribing if you don't already. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, y'all be safe out there. They're called boobs, Ed.